I thought that we'd take uh, some thoughts from Jeremiah 35, obviously. We've, we've come to Jeremiah in our daily readings again, and we will come upon Jeremiah 35 and the story of the Rechabites in just a couple of weeks' time as we work our way through um, through that book. But I, found, I find the uh, this particular story very um, very encouraging and, 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 and some really simple but powerful lessons that come out of it and uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to use those to help prepare us for the sharing of the emblems uh, in just a little while. So a few things for us to just think about this morning. First of all, who were these Rechabites? This story sort of seems to just lurch at us out of the middle of the book of Jeremiah, this story of the Rechabites. Who were they? What were they known for? And uh, how, <clears throat> how does their this story... Why is the story included and how does it help or apply uh, to us today? And uh, so uh, we'll, we'll try and consider those, those three things and obviously a few more and, uh, and some of those important principles that come out of it. Well, first of all, who were these Rechabites? Well, they were, they were named after uh, the, the, the founder of this clan, after Rechab. Um, and we don't, we're not going to turn to all of these uh, passages, but if you're making notes or you want to make a note, uh, Rechab, who was the, the father of this, um, this tribal clan, is mentioned in First Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 55. Now, the important thing to note here is that this Rechab, well, actually, we might just turn to this one because it's a really good foundation for us and, and it's why we... Um, be speaking about a lot of what we will be talking about. Let's just turn to First Chronicles, chapter two, and verse fifty-five to find out where these Rechabites actually come from. So First Chronicles two, verse uh, fifty-five. I won't get you to read this for us, Simon. I'm sorry to put you through that. Uh, uh, all those names there before. Um, but the families of the scribes which dwell at, uh, that dwell at uh, Jabez, the Tirathites and the Shimeathites, the Sukkothites, these are the Kenites that came from Hemath, the father of the house of Rechab. Okay, so this Rechab, the father of the house of Rechab, came from a larger tribal group. And that's why we've just turned to this verse. The larger tribal group is that of the Kenites. So Rechab a smaller family within this larger tribal group of the Kenites. Now, these Kenites were not part of Israel. They were a separate tribal group, but they were friends of Israel. They were a, a tribal group that associated themselves with Israel, helped Israel, and actually became assimilated into the nation. of the. They're so excellent was their relationship that they actually were assimilated into the nation of Israel. Now, if we go back just a little bit further into 1 Samuel chapter 15, so we can leave that one behind in Chronicles. Let's come back to 1 Samuel chapter 15. This is just painting the picture of where these Rechabites have come from. They've come from this larger tribal group called the Kenites, and these Kenites um, had decided that they wanted to be friends with Israel, and so friendly were they that they had become um, integrated into that nation, still as a separate tribal group, but um, friends within that house of Israel, as it were. So 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 6, we read here that Saul says uh, unto the Canaanites, um, sorry, I've got uh, 1 Kings, it should be 1 Samuel, obviously that'll help if I get the right uh, passage. 1 Samuel chapter uh, 15 and verse 6, Okay, so Saul says unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. So this is the time at which um, uh, the, the Kenites were given a choice by Saul. He was about to embark upon warfare against the Amalekites. And so he says to them, he says, You've got a choice, you Kenites. You've been friends of Israel. Go and depart from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them, for you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So they have to make a choice here. They had been kind to the Israelites. They had become assimilated with them, but they were also here with the Amalekites. And so Saul gives them a choice. And, of course, they made the choice and they chose Israel. The Canaanites departed from among the Amalekites. Well, can we see some, hopefully some similarities, perhaps some lessons for us here that 
Although we, as not part of natural Israel, we have become friends of Israel, we have, as it were, become assimilated into that nation, but we're also amongst the Amalekites. That's where we live. That's where we have to dwell in that sense. But we have to make that choice when it comes to the crunch. Who's real friends are we are we going to stay are we going to put our lot in with the Amalekites or are we going to choose Israel well of course we've made that choice but we've got to continue to make that choice so the Kenites had actually as we sort of gather from that particular passage they had accompanied Israel into the promised land and and that's how much that they had become assimilated. They settled and they lived with them. Now, in Judges chapter 1 and verse 16, we learn a little bit more about the Kenites. And in fact, uh, Moses' father-in-law was a Kenite. It says in Judges, we don't, we don't have to turn to this one, but in Judges chapter 1 verse 16, it says, The children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lies to the south of Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. So that's an important little uh, uh, snippet of information. These Kenites went up. Uh, Moses' father-in-law was one of these Kenites, and you can see how the, you know, that, that closeness of the bond would have taken place through that family and or that uh, relationship through marriage. And of course here in Judges chapter 1 verse 16 we learn that Moses' father-in-law Hobab or Jethro as he's uh, sometimes uh, uh, called um, uh, his daughter Zipporah she was they were Kenites they were part of this close little cooperative relationship uh, between this Israel of the flesh and the Kenites who like all of us have been grafted in that's the that's the expression that paul uses in the new testament uh, that that we have been grafted in to israel and that's what the kenites had been done here so that's a little bit of background about who they were where they came from and i can i think we can see well yes there's a direct relationship with our relationship with israel and 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 the hope of israel well what were the kenites known for did they have any anything that made them stand out well according to historians and some reputable ones uh, that that i had a look at the Kenites were literally smiths so they were uh, they were metal smiths they were blacksmiths they were workers in bronze and iron and of course that's where the surname smith comes from today um, but they were smiths that's exactly what a Kenite was uh, that's what the etymology of the word cannot is. It means a smith, a worker in metal, a worker in bronze and iron. They were blacksmiths. So if this was the case, which we have good reason to believe was was the case, the Kenites were not only good friends and allies of Israel, but they also had a commercial value. They had an industrial value uh, to them with these metalworking skills. They brought that to the table as part of uh, their friendship. Now by the time that we get to these later chapters of Jeremiah, during the times of the kings of Israel and Judah, the Kenites, or at least this specific family of Rechab, who were among that, they were that faithful clan within that larger, friendly clan of the Kenites. They're now living in Judah because they'd come into the land with them, but they were nomadic people. They lived in tents. They didn't put their roots down. They were strangers and pilgrims. They didn't plant crops. They didn't build houses. They were not attached to geography. And they also adhered to a strict policy of abstinence from alcohol. Now, Jonadab, Jonadab had imposed this upon his entire family. Let's come across uh, to 2 Kings chapter 10. And we see where this particular commandment came from. Now, so Jonadab who was uh, in, in his interaction uh, with Jehu, in, Jehu invites Jonadab up into his chariot. And so we come to 2 Kings 
at chapter 10 and verse, let's start at, say, verse 13. Jehu met with the brethren of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and said, Who are ye? And they answered, We are brethren of Ahaziah, and we go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the queen. And he said, Take them alive. And they took them alive and slew them at the, and slew them at the pit of the shearing house, even 42 men, neither left he any of them. And when he was departed from thence, he lighted upon John, Jehonadab, or Jonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said, Is your heart right as my heart is? And Jonadab answered, It is. And so the story uh, goes on. Uh, we won't, uh, won't read the rest of it, but he invites him up into his chariot for him to see the zeal uh, that he had uh, supposedly for Yahweh, his zeal for Yahweh. Now, so this is where this Jehonadab or Jonadab, it can, it, it's uh, used both ways in the scripture, same name, same person. We're not told exactly why or when this Jehonadab required this abstinence from alcohol that we read about in Jeremiah chapter 35. We're not told exactly where, exactly why, or exactly when, but I suggest to you that it's almost certainly because he wanted his family, his tribe, to be separate from the terrible evil that they saw in the rest of Israel as they slid into the, all of those practices of false worship and the evil practices that came uh, with that. And, and, and his principle, I, I'm almost certain, would have been to come you out from among them and to be separate. So even though that they were living within this land, uh, within uh, the nation of Israel, they had to separate themselves even down from that because of the of the um, the debauchery that was taking place in that nation. And so it's not a coincidence that Jeremiah chooses the Rechabites and their history of abstinence from alcohol to enact. What was a, a, a really a parable that we see here in Jeremiah 35, but it's the it's actually the flip side of another parable that we see in uh, that's in ten chapters earlier in Jeremiah. Let's come back to Jeremiah because we will come to this in just a, a week or so in our readings. Also, come back ten chapters to Jeremiah chapter 25. All right, so as we come across these in our readings over the next couple of weeks, let's try and think about these things. Now, Jeremiah 25 is a very interesting um, little scenario there. In Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah is berating the nation because for 10 years now he had been pleading with them by day and night to turn away from their false worship and idolatry. And because they hadn't, and because they wouldn't, the nation of Babylon was going to come upon them with great fury. And to demonstrate this, in Jeremiah 25, just you can scan through it as I'm sort of explaining it, Don't, I won't read through it, but in Jeremiah 25, it seems like if, if we look in, uh, in the middle of the chapter and towards the end, it seems like that there is a, a meeting here between... Uh, a very powerful gathering that's been organised of all the nations around Israel because they're trying to confederate against this rapidly rising threat of Babylon. And it seems that Jeremiah gate crashes this powerful, this powerful gathering. Jeremiah walks into the middle of this crowd and he pours out wine for all of these kings and the foreign ministers as it would, as it would have been. Um, he pours out wine and he forces them to drink. And you can it's, it's a very bizarre sort of a scene. But we'll look in verses 27 to 29, for example. He says, uh, it says, Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and arise no more, because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be, if they refuse to take the cup at your hand, then you shall say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, ye shall, shall certainly drink. So here you've got this scene of this, this large gathering of all these nations around uh, Israel and Judah. The foreign ministers, the kings, whoever it might have been, 
Jeremiah comes in and he gets all these goblets and he pours wine into them all and he forces them. He, he says, now you, king of Syria, you're going to drink this. And he might have decided to do it. And then, you know, the, the king of, um, you know, the, of, of um, Gilead or whatever might have said, oh, no, no, I don't want to do it. He says, Jeremiah, you're going to, uh, Jeremiah says to him, you're going to drink. He forces them. And he goes around the room and, and you can imagine them um, being completely perplexed by what's going on here. But here in Jeremiah 25, the, the lesson that Jeremiah imparts to them that God made him do uh, for them was that this wine that they were going to drink was to show them that they were going to reap what they had sown. They had been involved in the evil, the in evil in which they had been engaged and the judgments that God would bring upon them. They would drink of the wine of his wrath or his fury. That's how the wine here is used. Jeremiah says, you're going to drink all of this. Um, uh, verse 29 says, For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name, and should ye be utterly unpunished, ye shall not be unpunished, for I'll call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. So this wine, uh, this little parable that's being um, uh, depicted here in Jeremiah 25 was using wine also. But when we get to Jeremiah 35, wine is again produced by Jeremiah to teach a lesson, but it's, all, it's really the flip side of what we see here in Jeremiah 25. So we come back to Jeremiah 35, which is, of course, our main subject for today, and that was our reading, story of the Rechabites. And in Jeremiah 35, wine is produced, but it's done with a group of people who are faithful to God. They are God-fearing servants who live lives of integrity. And Jeremiah is teaching the same lesson, but in reverse. The lesson involving wine in Jeremiah 25 was teaching that obedience, uh, sorry, that disobedience would result in punishment. Here in Jeremiah 35, the lesson of the wine is that obedience obedience would result in salvation. The Rechabites, as we discover here in chapter 35, as we said already, are people who are living in tents in the region of Judah. But now the Babylonian army is coming and it's making its way up to besiege Jerusalem. And here they are out in probably in the Judean hills and uh, perhaps down to the to the south and uh, southwest of uh, Jerusalem, and they see Nebuchadnezzar's armies coming up, and as it were, they're out there in the fields, and and you know, to put a modern twist on it, they see Nebuchadnezzar's intercontinental ballistic missiles being hurled towards Jerusalem, and and Azekar, and uh, and 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 uh, uh, all, and, and Lachish, and so on, and all of a sudden they realise we're going to perish if we stay out here in the fields in our tents. And they realise it's time for them to pack up and roll up their tents and for the time being for them to take refuge in Jerusalem because it was a fortified city and it would afford some protection. And verse 11 of Jeremiah um, 35 makes that pretty clear. And so that's why they find themselves, they, these tent-dwelling nomads are now forced to go inside the walled city of Jerusalem to seek refuge and to seek help. And so God tells Jeremiah to gather these Rechabites into a side room of the temple. Now those side rooms existed there. They it stored the goods and also the Levites and, and uh, um, uh, used those rooms uh, and, and, and for housing and, and for storage of goods and so on. And when they gathered together there in verse 3, it's hard to know how many, we're not told, but it seems like just more than a handful. Jeremiah again pours out wine, it says into pots. So that, what that really means is not a huge pots, it means goblets. It means large vessels for drinking. And that's what he does. So he's perhaps got a big table there, perhaps uh, you know several tables like what we've got here, and he pours out this wine into these goblets. And you've got this whole family of the, of the Rechabites there and he says he invites them to drink. 
and here you've got this teetotaling family wondering what on earth is going on here. And it, it would, the scene would have been a bit like, you know, for at, at, at a conference of uh, vegetarians to have a nice, uh, big, juicy, medium rare tomahawk steak with just the right amount of marbling in it and have it there sizzling on a platter and invite the vegetarian conference to, you know, come and tuck in. They just wouldn't do it, right? Because it's just what you don't do. And that's what it was here. And the Rechabites would not touch. They politely decline uh, to, uh, to take uh, that wine. Now, it's at this point that it's easy with the story of the Rechabites to get a little bit um, sidetracked by the question of the alcohol itself, you know, uh, and, and to make the, this the central point of the story. It's easy to sort of make this formula, the Rechabites don't drink alcohol uh, they refused it when it was offered to them, and we shouldn't drink alcohol either. Mind you, if you have a conscience about that, um, and if you share the conviction of the Rechabites, then you shouldn't uh, either, because that's what Paul tells us in places like Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 and 10. But that's not what this story, this story is about. It's, alcohol is not the point of the message here. And neither is the message that God is tempting the Rechabites, trying to make them sin against their own conscience, as though he's trying to make them fail. No, God, uh, alcohol's not the central point here, nor is God setting up the Rechabites for failure. He is setting them up for success. Because he knew their character, he knew their conviction, and he knew their principles. He knew that they were, and this is one of our major points, that if you don't remember anything else that we've said this morning, just please try and keep this one in your mind. The Rechabites were principled people living in an unprincipled world. And their refusal to break that conviction that they held showed the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and Jeremiah uses this as the lesson, that these unprincipled people of Judah and Jerusalem were now having the Babylonian armies coming upon them because of their unprincipled life. But these Rechabites lived by their principles in sharp contrast to them. They had turned, the, the, the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah had turned to other gods. And now they see these invading armies coming upon them from Nebuchadnezzar. And God is, is putting them in a position, these Rechabites, not to tempt them beyond what they could bear and make them fail, but he's using them as an example of to the the wider community of how to live a principled life in a very unprincipled world. And so when Jeremiah puts this proposition, well, it's not just a proposition, there's, there's cups, there's goblets full of wine before them. And all they had to do was reach out and bring it to their lips. But they restate politely their history. They sincerely take an oath not to take wine and the principles that governed this decision. And God uses this as a powerful lesson. You see, here were these Rechabites who were not actually members of natural Israel, who were obeying the commands of their forefathers. And then you've got them in the midst of Israel and Judah, God's own people, his real people, his natural people, who were not obeying the commands of their heavenly Father. You see the contrast? That's what, that's what it's all about. These faithful Rechabites could maintain their integrity and obey their earthly Father's commands from those generations before. But you people of Judah and Jerusalem, you can't adhere to the commands that I, your heavenly Father, have given you. And so... God is using these Rechabites as an example of people who were living by principle, living by conviction. And he's using them to show Judah. See these people here? You could avoid the devastation and the destruction that the Babylonians are about to bring. You could be spared from all of this if you were prepared to live by my principles. <coughs> Pardon me. Just as the Rechabites have lived, have lived by theirs. Excuse me. But because the people of Judah and Jerusalem had refused, they'd rejected his commandments, that judgment was coming upon them. And so Jeremiah drives home this lesson. Uh, we'll just reread verses 12 
uh, 12 to 14 of Jeremiah 35. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction to hearken to my words, saith the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed. For unto this day they drank none, but obey their father's commandment, notwithstanding I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but you hearkened not unto me. They were principled people living in an unprincipled world. So, brothers and sisters, where do we find ourselves in this story? Are we there with the Rechabites? Let's remember a few things about who they were. First of all, who were they? They were tent-dwelling nomads without a real attachment to this world. This is a reminder for us, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that we should be just like that, strangers and pilgrims, just passing through, not to be attached to the world. We should be citizens of Zion, not citizens of Australia or any other country for that matter. I mean, I, 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 we were reminded of that recently, Loss and I had the uh, privilege of doing a little travel recently. And of course, when you travel overseas, the most important thing that you have with you, apart from each other, is your passport. It's the one thing you don't want to lose because you're in all sorts of trouble. And your passport is of a vital importance. Every time you, would, you, know, you pack up and move to a new place, we'd always check, have we got our passports? Because you just don't want to lose that. And every time we do that, I would just always sort of think about like something like this uh, with the Rechabites and, and other ideas, and that is that really we attach such great importance to a passport that tells me that I am a citizen of Australia. But really, what I would like to do is when I go to customs or go to the passport control, hand them my real passport, which is the one that says I'm a citizen of Zion. Now, it's not going to help me get into a foreign country uh, today very well, but you know what I'm saying. That's the passport that we really should value. And do we carry that? Are we card-carrying citizens of Zion and have that passport close to our heart at all times? We we're very careful to make sure we didn't lose our natural passports. Let's be even more careful to make sure that we don't lose our spiritual passport. Because that's what the Rechabites had done. They were not citizens of this world. They were tent dwellers. They were nomads. But have we ditched that idea, brothers and sisters, or, and have we put our roots down? Have we become integrated socially, socially, emotionally, practically in this country, in this world? Is that where we're citizens of? Peter in First Peter chapter... Uh, sorry... Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 says that we are sojourners. That's the word that he uses. Is that how we feel? Is that how we behave? Are we Rechabites or are we card-carrying citizens of this world? So that's the first thing about the Rechabites. The second thing is that they remain true to their principles despite what was on offer before them, despite what was going on around them in Jerusalem and Judah. They were the principled people living in an unprincipled world. You know, in Jeremiah's time, many of the people, and we haven't got time to go through this, but for example, in chapter 7, chapter uh, 44, many of the people were, were telling Jeremiah off and they, they hated him because they had, uh, that Jeremiah was telling them that they shouldn't be worshipping the Queen of Heaven. He'd interrupted their worship. He'd helped to, uh, to um, destroy some of the, uh, the images and, and, and so on. But the Rechabites stood apart as a faithful remnant. They held fast to their values, but the people of Judah and Jerusalem were worshipping the Queen of Heaven and they were angry with Jeremiah when he would interfere with that, with that, um, with that worship. Interestingly, it wasn't God who had told the Rechabites not to drink wine. It was Jonadab who had imposed that principle and his descendants had held on to that as a very important one to maintain. And I wonder if we are inspired by this example of the Rechabites remaining, uh, remaining faithful to the, to the principles that we know in our own hearts to be right, maintaining those principles and, and values 
that are helpful to us to give glory and honour to God? Or do we find ourselves watering those things down? The values that we once held in the face perhaps of pressures from without, pressures from within, and we justify uh, that we change our, uh, our, our core values and principles because we think, well, it won't do any harm. Other people around us are doing that, so I guess it's okay for me to do that too. Well, I'd suggest that that's what Paul has in mind in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12 where he says, all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient or helpful. Yes, all things are lawful, but is it really helpful to me to get me to the kingdom and my family? And in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, where he talks about the conscience of the weak and the strong, strong brother. Yes, we have liberties, but exercising those liberties, is that really helpful for us and for our brothers and sisters? And Paul rounds it out in chapter 10 when grappling with this dilemma of, should I eat meat that had been previously offered to an idol or not? In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 he says, Whether you therefore eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. In other words, wherever your conviction on such matters lies, make sure that your decisions and your behaviour gives glory to God. And the third thing is that, about the Rechabites, the third thing is that we want to um, uh, just sort of round out a little bit on uh, this morning is that the Rechabites were not set up by Jeremiah and God for failure. They were set up for success. God knew that the Rechabites wouldn't succumb to that temptation. Yes, it was a real temptation. It wasn't just so, some sort of uh, sham or play acting. It was real, it was immediate, but it was not beyond their ability to resist and resist they did. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ did exactly the same. He was placed in many situations where he was tested and tried. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. God didn't lead Jesus into the wilderness after his baptism to set him up for failure. He set him up for success. Jesus was able to resist that temptation because he had exercised his mind unto godliness and he was able to deflect those immediate, strong and powerful temptations at that time. God didn't allow Peter to set Jesus up for, for failure up in Caesarea Philippi, Banias, when Jesus told the disciples that he had to go down to Jerusalem and be crucified and... and, and um, um, We'll be reading uh, in just a few days' time the passage in Matthew chapter 16, again in our New Testament readings, we're coming around to that again, um, where, um, where you know, we, we know the story well, where Peter says, no, no, Lord, you don't have to go and do that. Um, don't go and suffer those things down in Jerusalem. And, of course, the Lord has to turn and say to Peter, get you behind me, Satan. If you're an offence unto me, you savour not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And then Jesus says unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, he says three things. He says, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And the disciples, Peter and all of the disciples who were supposed to be helping Jesus face this ordeal, here they were acting in the exact reverse of that. But Jesus was able to turn back against that temptation and use it as a lesson for Peter and for us that we need to be prepared to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. Now in the world that we live in, uh, that's not what we're encouraged to do, is it? It's the exact reverse. Just like the Rechabites found themselves at odds with what was going on around them. In the world around us, we're not uh, encouraged to deny ourselves. We're encouraged to indulge ourselves. We're not encouraged to take up our cross. We're encouraged to hand over the cross to someone else to carry. Ignore the cross altogether. We're not encouraged to follow him. We are encouraged to turn around and walk away from our Lord Jesus. And so that 
is the example that the Lord uses. He was able to overcome that temptation, and so we have to endeavour uh, to do exactly what he has described there. And then thinking about our Lord Jesus again in that moment when when perhaps he came closest to, to, to succumbing, when he was most sorely tempted of all in, in, the, garden, in the Garden of Gethsemane. God didn't set him up for failure there, but rather for success. And succeed he did uh, because he had learned obedience. And he was able to say, Nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Paul in Hebrews 5 says, who in the days of his flesh when he'd offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. And you can imagine those scenes like in the Garden of Gethsemane and at other times. Strong crying and tears from our Lord unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though yet he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And that's why we're here this morning, brothers and sisters, and that's why we have those memorials on the table before us. Because, of course, our Lord Jesus was the ultimate Rechabite. Just turning our thoughts back to the Rechabites finally. He's just, they were just really a tiny cameo of he who was to come to show all of those principles and more that we've seen in the Rechabites this morning. He was truly a stranger and pilgrim like they were. I mean, you think about it. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he had nowhere to be born. He was born in a manger in Bethlehem. He had nowhere to really call his home. We know that, yes, he did uh, uh, sort of, he called Capernaum his home, but he had no actual home himself. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air has nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. He had nowhere to be born, nowhere to call his home. He had nowhere to die. He had to be laid to rest in a garden tomb that was donated by a compassionate friend. Yes, he was, in a very real sense, a Rechabite, a, t a tent dweller from birth to death. And secondly, he was the ultimate example of that principled living, living a perfect life of obedience, a principled life in an unprincipled world, complete obedience to his father, as indeed the Rechabites had done to their father, Jonadab. But of course, our Lord Jesus did it in all points, every part of his life. And right from the very beginning, from the beginning of God's plan of salvation, he was provided, our Lord Jesus Christ was provided so that he could be a success. He was not set up for failure, he was set up for success. Yes, it was real trial, yes, it was real suffering, uh, but he was able to overcome that and so to become the captain of our salvation by leading captivity captive. He was the one who, when given a little taste of the kingdom at his transfiguration and was conversing uh, with those two men who were dragged out of the dust, Moses and Elijah, to help inspire him for the final part of his journey to the cross. Moses, who'd led that physical exodus but hadn't managed to lead Israel on an exodus from sin. And Elijah, likewise, who, who attempted to do the same, but he was unsuccessful in the face of Ahab and Jezebel. He couldn't lead Israel on a, an exodus from sin, even though on Mount Carmel it looked as though he had succeeded for a short time. But our Lord Jesus Christ was able to accomplish that decease, that exodus, as is the word in Luke chapter 9, verse 31, that exodus from sin and death for which we are so very thankful. Wherefore, as a result... Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, higher than the Rechabites, higher than Jonadab, a name above every name. And so let us come and remember that name and that work now, brothers and sisters. And at the, at the same time, let's use that example of the Rechabites that we've just considered for a few moments this morning 
Let's use that to try to become a little more like our Lord Jesus so that we can be strangers, that we can be principled people living in an unprincipled world so that when in we pray a very short time, we meet him face to face, he will be pleased for us, uh, to, uh, for, uh, he will be pleased to take us unto him forevermore.